welcome everybody to Vectors Day 2. So, uh, vectors are super cool, they're super awesome, super useful. They're one of the most important uh, data structures you're ever going to use in your life. Uh, last time we showed you the basic way of doing them, we can make a vector of doubles named Vec of size 100 like this, and this is like we have just created 100 uh, doubles all at once. Now, uh, you can also make this a variable. You can have it be a variable size. You have integer x equals 42, and then this will make a vector of size 42. You could also do something like this. You could read the value from the keyboard, and then it'll have whatever size you type in there. So if you type in 10, it'll make a vector of size 10. If you have it 100, make a vector of size 100. This can be useful if, for example, uh, the user can tell you in advance, like, hey, I've got uh, 10 tax receipts for you to process. The user says, give me a vector size 10. You're like, all right. And then uh, you know, how many how many tax receipts? And then it creates a vector of that size. And then you can do something like this. For every double by reference, always use by reference if you're going to be modifying it, and the vector cn into that variable. And then you can read in uh, 10 different uh, doubles into the vector. Or if you want to use the read library, which is, of course, the superior choice for doing input, you just do that. Uh, we got x twice here, huh? Uh, let's make the size just so it's not confusing for the people. There we go. Okay. And so this will, either way will work, either CN or read. And this is going to fill the vector with data from the user. Now, that is our first learning point for today. Learning point number one. One, vectors can be variable size. Arrays cannot, sort of. Okay. So if we made an array, like if we said, uh, give me a double array named R, of size size, technically this is not valid C++. This is technically not allowed. Arrays are supposed to have constant size, constant uh, compile time determinable size. However, uh, the C language actually allows this. And because the C language allows it, the compilers for C++ will allow it as well. Um, it's technically invalid C++. This is uh, technically wrong, but um, it'll work anyway. Um, don't use arrays. They're terrible. Okay. So uh, there's there's basically, a, a, like I said, in CSI 40, you have no reason to use an old C-style array like that. Oh. Only reason you got to know them is because you're going to see other people using them that have not been enlightened to the ways of vectors yet. Or there's also something in, in C++ called a C++ array. this array of integers of size size and r and that one you can see it's being strict on you can, it has to be a constant expression right um so you make an array of size 100 that way the c plus plus array is like the c style array but just superior in every way you can do bounce checking and things like that whereas um c style arrays um don't have any bounce checking capabilities it's sort of uh, it relies on you to bounce check them properly with a hope and a prayer a lot of times. So, vectors can be variable size. Arrays can't, technically, sort of. Here's learning point number two. Vectors of size zero are actually really useful. Arrays of size zero are pointless. And probably... So if you made an array, double r of size zero, this is probably, it, it's gonna compile, but it doesn't do anything. How many elements can it store? None. <laughs> so what's the point? <laughs> it, it can store nothing. It can't do anything. It's, complete, it's a complete waste of everyone's time. However, if you make a vector of size zero, then that's actually really useful. And you can make a vector of size zero like this. That has no elements. Okay. 
this is a size zero vector. And you're like, ah, oh, that's useless. Why would you, why would you ever want to do this? And, and the truth of the matter is I do it this way most of the time. This is usually how I make my vectors. And the reason for that is because I'll be doing something like reading uh, from a file or something, and I don't know how many words are in the file. So what I could do is I could open the file and read through it and count how many words are in it and then close it and then make a vector of that size and then reopen it again and read into it. But that's horrible. It's much better to just make a vector of size zero. And then as you go, you can add things to the vector. Learning point two, vectors are growable arrays. Okay, they can get bigger. You can help push back on them. Vector.push back allows you to add numbers to a vector. 1.1, 2.2, 3.3. The vector now has three elements in it. It has size three. And we can do things like for every double in the vector, see out the double. And you'll see it prints out. It prints out one, two, and three. Okay. We don't need to ask in advance how many tax receipts there's going to be. So a lot of times the human doing it won't know. They got like 50 tax receipts in front of them. And they're like, I don't know. They count it. 49, you know, and then they enter 49 of them and there's one left over there. Like, ah, dang it. You know, I can't enter it now, you know. So it's superior, usually in most cases, for you to create a vector of size zero and then use what's called the pushback function to add something to the end of the vector. And it just... The vector now contains elements in whatever order you did push back in. So the first element, index 0, is 1.1, index 1 is 2.2, index 2 is 3.3. So it just puts them in puts them in order. And the vector will just grow and grow and grow as much as you want. And this is really useful when working with um, input. Okay. So let me show you a pattern. I'll just keep the printout down here. Let me show you a pattern that I use all the time. This is an extremely useful pattern. It's well worth memorizing. So let's say that we are going to be reading uh, tax receipts from the user. Like we're writing like a, a, we're making like QuickBooks or something like this, like an accounting program. And uh, the user is going to be typing in all the receipts for tax purposes. Okay. So we're going to have an infinite loop. And it's going to go until the user says they're done. All right. So the user doesn't have to count, they, they, they don't have to like sit there and go through their receipts and count them all in advance. They don't have to know in advance how many receipts they're going to have. All they have to do is just type, start typing numbers in. This one's for $8. This one's for 22.2. And just type all the numbers in. So we do it like this. Uh, double X is equal to read. Please enter a tax receipt. Like that. Look, and uh, maybe zero to click, something like that. So if they type zero, we're done. We break out of the loop. So if x is equal to zero, break. Now, there is, do you guys understand? So if they type in zero, we quit out of the infinite loop. Every time you do a while true loop, you have to make sure that there is a way out of the infinite loop. So because otherwise it's infinite. You're never getting out of there, right? So there is nothing in that straw. Okay, As there is a shorter way of doing this, which is this. And you will see this all the time in computer science, not in Java. Java does not allow this. It's one of Java's weaknesses. Um, why does if not x mean the same thing as if x double equals zero? Why? Why is not x the same thing as checking to see if x is equal to zero. Let's get an answer in chat. Not a rhetorical question. Why is if not x? The same thing as writing if x double equals zero. Nothing, okay? Zero is false. So, Zero is false, anything else is true. So if x is zero, x is false. So not of false is what? What is the not of false? 
true. So if x is 0, x is false, the not a false is true, the if statement will execute, and it will break out of the loop if and only if x is 0. So this is shorthand, very, very common in computer science. This is like saying if x is 0. Okay. If x is 0, break. Now, we should also probably get into the habit of vetting our input. What sorts of tax receipts are valid? Which ones are invalid? What do you guys think? What's the smallest amount of a tax receipt we should be able to process? Answer valid? Sure. $5. You know, you go to Applebee's and get yourself a, you know, $10 baby back ribs or something. I don't know. Whatever you guys like for your microwave food. Um, uh, you can put it in. It can be a whole number. Sure. Answer valid. What kinds of numbers are, uh, <laughs> hope nobody here works at Applebee's. Um, I asked a friend if he wanted to get Applebee's with me and he's like, it's all right. I can microwave my own food at home. So, uh, what is the smallest tax receipt we should allow? What do you guys think? We're, we're doing QuickBooks. We're doing accounting. You guys got to be talking on chatter. I will sit here and just stare at you for a while. What is the smallest tax receipt we should allow? And you have an expense that's negative. Let's say one cent. Okay. I would say so. So if X is less than one cent, then exit or die or whatever, but we're not going to worry about that too much. Right now. Okay. So we're vetting our, we're vetting our input. Good. Uh, what's the maximum tax receipt? Like if you, if you, uh, if you walk in with a receipt at what, what size number that the user types in, should we be like, mm, no, that's probably wrong. What do you guys think? What's the, what's the biggest tax receipt you could possibly have? What do you guys think? Ten million dollars. Okay, if X is greater than ten million dollars, then we're going to reject it. If they need to enter an expense account for a yacht or something, uh, they can use a real accounting program, not ours. Okay, so but that it's good to check for that because doubles can take numbers up to like you know ten to this you know seventieth. You know, like you can have a really large you know you can have atoms of the universe in dollars, you know, as an expense. And that's probably invalid. So probably having some, some maximum size just to stop people from fat fingering something is probably a good idea. What if, uh, what if they enter squirrel? What's going to happen? Reed will stop that. Yeah. But there is a possibility of CN becoming invalid. So I guess if CN becomes invalid, we'll just stop inputting things as well at that point. If you hit control D on the on the input, it'll it'll return from read and CN will be invalid. That's about the only way that if you control D out of an input. Control D sends an end of file character. So that's good. Okay, so we've got all our vetting done. Now we need to do the magic. We need to add the number we read in. So the user just typed in, I spent 54.63 at Yosemite Ranch. Cool. So we need to add it to the vector. And we do it with push back. Okay. So we're going to push back x. This adds x to the vector and grows the size of the vector by 1. This is huge. It's huge. It's really important. The reason why it's important is because back in the olden days, when we had arrays, you would have to know in advance how many tax receipts the user is going to need, right? So the user, the, the programmer would have to say like, okay, we're going to allow a maximum of 1,000 tax receipts. No more. If you want more than that, talk to us. We'll make you a custom version. You know, the reason for that is because a thousand doubles takes up 8k of RAM. And if you're on a Commodore 64 with 64k of RAM, 8k of RAM is a huge amount of RAM. 
And then maybe the user only has 20 tax receipts. So you've wasted 8K of RAM for no purpose. And so they would have to guess a big number because like, they don't want to be the guy that's like, oh yeah, our system only accepts 20 receipts. Sucks to be you. Ho hope you don't have 30 receipts. Like they don't want to be that guy, but at the same time, if they make the number really big, like, well, let's allow for a million receipts. Well, that's going to take up eight megs of RAM. You don't have eight megs of RAM on a Commodore 64, not even close. And so these programmers would just guess some arbitrarily large number and hope that it was enough. Microsoft Excel, up until very recently, had a limit of 32,000 rows and cells, or rows and columns, rather. 32,000 seems like a lot, but it's not a lot. It's, it's really not. And uh, I exceeded it when uh, trying to do a graph, I was doing a scatter plot for a defense contractor. They had a test pattern that had row and column information. And I wanted to, uh, to do a scatter plot on it and see if the pattern that Excel, generate, Excel generated was the same pattern that the pattern generator was making. And uh, I could only graph the first 32,000 points. So I did, and I'm like, hey, here's the left top left corner of it. Is that what you're looking for? And they're like, yeah, it looks right. It's probably fine. Um, but that was just a number they picked, you know? Like, here's the limit, you know? Hope you don't need more than that. Yeah, sucks to be you. With vectors, you don't need to do that anymore. You do not have to predetermine how many receipts your program can handle, you know? You can just start with size zero. And then you're not wasting RAM either. Right? You just start with size zero. How much RAM does that take up? Almost nothing. You know? And as, as you add 100, 1,000, a million elements, it, the memory usage just grows with the amount of tax receipts you're entering, the number of baseball uh, records you're entering. It's just, the, you know, you don't waste really any RAM. There's maybe a factor of two that it wastes due to how it's implemented under the hood. But even a factor of two wastage is way better than what we used to do, which was like, uh, let's just make a, you know, every string of size 100, just in case somebody has a really long name, you know? And so every single time you make a name, it's an array of size 100 or 80 was very common too. So I hope your first name isn't longer than 80 letters. Hope your last name isn't longer than 80 letters. Hope your address isn't longer than 80 letters, which can't happen. And then it just wastes all that RAM because my name is Bill. So you need four bytes and it would waste 76. I've exceeded that converting in JSON into Excel. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's not that hard to have 30, like 32,000 is not that large number, you know? So this pattern here is wonderful. You start with a vector of size zero, and then over and over again, you push things into the vector. And then you can do things with it. You can print it to the screen. That's the standard pattern for printing to the screen. You can do things like add up all the numbers that are in the that are in the vector. In fact, that's what I want you guys to do now. So for a little bit of lab time, I want you guys to number one, add up all the numbers in VEC and print it to the screen. Number two, I want you to multiply product. Multiply. And then number three, I want you to see if you can remember how to do this. Sort all the elements in the vector. Print the vector. And then print the minimum and maximum. All right. Maybe we could do average too. Print the minimum, the maximum. We did this last time, so it should be easy for you and average. All right, I'm gonna give you guys half an hour to work on this. And then we'll move on to files after this. So uh, lab time begins now. Uh, everybody please stream your screens. Let me see you working on the lab time here. You can just copy this pattern right here and that'll handle your input. And always copy it and run it first. I've seen a lot of people in lab time like forget to put down main. And so, so I know that you've never run your program once. You've never compiled your program once. When you're doing lab time, 
you should get into the habit of like writing a little bit of code and saving it, compiling it, and testing it, and then editing a little more, saving it, right? If I if I look at your code and I see that you've never compiled your code, you have not learned anything in lab time. You have to constantly be writing code, and testing your code, and looking at it, and looking at the output, and making sure everything's correct. Okay. So. Uh, Everybody, please stream your screen so I can watch you during lab time and see how you see how you code and uh, include. Uh, you misspelled include, Brandis. Uh, that the uh, C and the L there need to be need to be different. Okay, right. so half an hour begins now. All right, and we are back. So. Uh, here we've got uh, one student's code. Uh, we are doing all the input that we had there, printing it out. Cool. Sum, starting at the beginning, going to the end of the vector, adding each element of the vector to the sum. That is correct. If you print out the sum, you should be getting it correct. But for product, there we go. Yes, the alarm's going off. We're done with lab time now. I have to shake it to turn off the alarm. And done. There we go. Um, the product though is not working. And the reason why it's not working is because uh, you initialize it to zero. The identity with summation is zero. Anything plus zero is that thing. The identity with product is one. Anything times one is that thing. When you multiply something by zero, you get zero. And so zero times the first element of the vector is gonna give you zero. Zero times the second element is gonna be zero over and over again. So you're never gonna get not zero there, that should be a one, and then this isn't valid down here. You're probably gonna do a sort or something down there. Um, let's take a look over here. So uh, for every element in vec, add it to the sum, multiply it in, good, this one is initialized to one. If x is less than min, min equals x. If x is greater than max, max equals x, good. Average, min, sum, sort, cool. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, that is cool. Um, there's actually an easier way than 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 that. Um, so last time we talked about min element and max element, which um, doesn't look like anyone did. But there's actually an e even easier version. So let me let me solve it for you guys real fast. Set up all the numbers. So we'll have a double sum equals zero. Uh, good. All of you guys are using doubles and not integers. Good. 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 Yeah, double sum equals zero for every uh, double in the vector. Uh, we're going to add that number to it. And that is our sum. Okay, for the product, double product equals one for every double in the vector. Uh, I don't know why I can't type today. I think it's because my keyboard's at a weird angle. So I'm like sitting like this. Uh, for every double in the thing, the product is going to be times equaled by x. See out. Uh, what are you mad about here? Okay, thank you. See out the product. And then sort all the elements of the vector. It can be done like this sort vector.begin, vector.end. So sort it from the beginning to the end. And it is now sorted, printing the vector. Uh, for, I think I have that already, right? Yeah, there it is. Okay. I'm to repeat that. Done. And then print the minimum, maximum, and average. Cool. So that code that we just saw a second ago uh, works fine. Uh, it works fine, but there's an easier version. So uh, one of the easier versions is using min element and max element. So you could say C out star min element vec dot begin begin, back dot end, like that. That'll give you the minimum element, but there's an even easier version because it's sorted, the first element's the minimum. So you just see out vector dot at zero or vector dot front. Vector dot front contains the first element in the vector. Uh, the maximum is the last element. So we could see out max element and do that whole thing, or we just see out the last element in the vector, which is vector dot at vector dot size minus one, like that. So if you have 10 elements in your vector, the last element is element nine, which is in other words, vector size minus one. 
Or if you if that looks kind of gnarly to you, vector dot back is the last element in the vector. And uh, uh, why do you need a star? Because the the min element and the max element function return a pointer or something called a, an iterator uh, to it points at the element in the vector. So the star operator dereferences it. You guys remember how we talked about with the references kind of briefly. You can see how like the address of a variable like that. The star operator gives you the very the value at that address. And so the uh, min element and max element give you essentially a pointer to a, a thing. So you have to use the star operator to dereference it. So it's star min element or star max element uh, to dereference it. Um, but you don't need to do that. You just print out the first or the last. After it's been sorted, the first element's the minimum, the last element's the maximum, even, even simpler than anything you can think of. Okay, and then the average, uh, we can use accumulate for this. So accumulate uh, from vector dot uh, begin to vector dot end is 0.0, because .0, it's a double. If you use a zero here, it's gonna do integer arithmetic. It's a rough edge that most people don't know about. Yeah, this accumulate that divided by vector dot size, and now we got the average accumulate is inside of numeric. Okay, so this uh, minimum, maximum, and then accumulate adds up everything inside of the vector. The only tricky part is if you're doing doubles, you need to use a double zero there zero in double math. If you put an integer zero there, it will do integer arithmetic, not double arithmetic. Uh, could you, should you remember this last function or you could use some from earlier to get it? Fine too. Um, in fact, since we've already done the sum, might as well, All right? Sum divided by size. There you go. Less typing. Oh uh, yeah, accumulates, accumulates one of those things that just all the experienced C++ people know. Um, it just has that rough edge where if you're not if you're not adding up integers, if you put an integer zero in as the uh, starting value to add up, then it will do integer arithmetic. So this way is probably better with the sum. Okay, so that is uh, that is vectors part two, and this is this is the main thing I want you to get here, which is that the the most common way that I handle input, like if I'm reading from a file, I just start with a vector of size zero, I go into an infinite loop, I read one element at a time, and I grow the vector. I, I first vet it, I make sure, you know, no errors occurred, it's in the right range, and I, then I grow the vector using pushback. Pushback makes the vector one bigger every time and puts whatever value you push back in there into the last slot in the vector. So if you push back one, two, three, your vector now contains one, then two, then three. Maybe. Okay. So that is, that's about it for vectors. There's a lot of functions that run on it. Um, accumulate, um, sort, min element, max element. Where can you find out about what kinds of things you can do on them? Uh, there is the website CPP reference and vector is actually the first hit that you get on that. That's amazing. And then uh, the things that vectors have on them are begin, end, is it empty, size, how many elements are in it, um, push back, add to the back. You cannot push front on a vector. You can only add things to the back of a vector. Uh, empty the vector. Um, that's kind of the main ones there. Then there is the C++ containers library. You'll learn more about these in uh, 41. Then there is the numerics library, which uh, have things like accumulate in it, iota, which fills it with like one, two, three, four, five, uh, transform, which you can use to like fill with random data. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, algorithms, which has things like sort. That's useful. Um, find, find out if, an, if a number is in the vector. Um, transform is useful, generate's useful. Uh, search and replace, reverse. You wanna take all the elements in the vector and switch them around, you can use reverse on that. Um, shuffle, if you wanna shuffle all the elements in a vector. Um, partition. So that's not very useful. Min, min element, max element. Find out if something's a permutation 
doesn't really matter for you guys. Uh, no. So you can you can kind of read through the these um, reference things and see if there's any functions that speak to you. What is a Nibloid? I have no idea, man. Like, there's a lot of stuff in the standard library. I have no idea. Like we talked about like vessel functions and all this kind of stuff. There's standard library functions to be vessel functions. I have, I have no idea, man. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there that I, I don't even know what they mean, you know, let alone use. And that's fine. You don't, nobody knows everything in C++, not even Bjarne Easter's book, not even the standards committee. Okay, so that is, that's kind of our end of discussion of vectors. Uh, we're going to use them in our next lecture, which starts in a second. <laughs>